Thessalonians, if you'd like to turn your Bibles there, some have not been in this class before, just explain what we're doing. This class is aimed at preparing teachers to teach what's coming up next quarter for our young people's classes, um, but those who aren't teaching next quarter are welcome to come in as long as we have room. That's fine as well. So next quarter will be uh, in the second quarter of study of the epistles for our young people, and so this is a sort of the beginning of that. We just studied 1 Thessalonians. We're in 2 Thessalonians tonight. It's our coverage of the epistles is not really a survey, but it's not really in-depth either. It's just sort of in between there somewhere where we're trying to get thorough knowledge of what's in each epistle, each epistle without uh, getting bogged down too much for the kids to get a basic understanding. And so we're trying to help the teachers kind of prepare for that. Um, 2 Thessalonians, uh, it's a great epistle. It's obviously a follow-up to 1 Thessalonians, from which Paul writes uh, to the Thessalonians not long after the church had been planted. He's writing it from Corinth and uh, sends Timothy up to check on them and gets a report from Timothy. Timothy comes back to Corinth, and then this is sort of the follow-up epistle to, to the first one. And he deals with uh, some of the same issues, in fact, several of them, and then a, a, another uh, thing is added into it. So if you just want to think about this, uh, the theme of 2 Thessalonians, there are certain expectations for faith and practice uh, relative to the second coming of Christ. He, in, we said in 1 Thessalonians, in every chapter, he mentions the second coming of Christ. This is what's to keep them going through the afflictions and tribulations. Uh, this is what they are to look to as their hope as they go through these difficult times. And if they can stay solid with their minds focused on the second coming and preparing for that, they can get through the, the difficult times uh, more easily. And so what, Paul, what Paul's going to tell them in, in this epistle, a couple of things he focuses on, is that apostolic tradition must guide the way. If you look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 15, uh, he says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. So he wants, to, wants them to hold on to the traditions. We've talked about this word a little bit. We'll talk about it some more as it's used a couple of times in, in 2 Thessalonians. But the idea of an apostolic tradition is a tradition is something that's handed down. So when Paul uses that word, he is saying that what I gave you was handed down to me. He uses a similar word when he's writing to the Corinthians. He says, that which I, was, that which I delivered to you. So in other words, he, he's a delivery man, right? Which means the implication is, this is the message is coming from God. And so he's handing it down to, to them. It's God's message. And he says as much a couple of times in 1 Thessalonians. You received it not as the word of man, but as the word of God. Okay. So uh, this idea of as they're going through difficult times, as they're not really sure about the anticipation of the second coming of Christ, as they're having issues in the church there and issues uh, with the persecution and affliction, uh, stay focused on uh, the apostolic tradition and do not grow weary in doing good. And uh, this is one of the themes that was suggested in the reader's material. If you're using that to teach the next quarter, do not grow weary in doing good. So like 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians also contains at least one reference to the second coming in every chapter. And Paul is really writing as much as anything to clear up some misunderstandings that the Thessalonians continued to have about the second coming. He definitely helped them in some things that he wrote to them in 1 Thessalonians, obviously, but they continue to have some, some issues. And so he writes... Uh, to clear some of those problems up. And the main thing is that they expected the second coming to be pretty much immediate, uh, any time, uh, coming very quickly. And they were so certain of it that they were doing some things, or maybe I should say not doing some things, <laughs> that they were supposed to be doing. They kind of quit working. Uh, that's where this admonition to don't grow weary in doing good comes in. All right, so that's just a real brief introduction to... Second Thessalonians, real brief. Um, but here's my outline of it. Uh, as you all know, I like to use outlines in teaching text to just to, it's a good way to get the overview of the flow of a book. So I, I always, as I'm either studying or teaching a book, I like to outline it first. And I don't even use old outlines most of the time. I go through it afresh 
and outline again helps me uh, follow the train of thought. Uh, so it, what I saw this time in outlining, it, the, the first chapter is dealing with uh, perseverance in persecution. They're being persecuted still. That was uh, a main theme of First Thessalonians. And just keep on keeping on as you're going through that. He, he, he's thankful for their endurance. Um, he's continually given thanks uh, for what, they're, what they've been able to go through. The second major section is uh, th this problem of a premature expectation of Christ's coming. And that's kind of the core of 2 Thessalonians. This, they have this expectation that Christ is coming and um, they're a bit premature on that. And then the third major section is that they need to stand fast in the traditions. And if they don't stand fast in the traditions, folks need to be disciplined. Okay, that, but that all goes together. Uh, so really those three major section and sections and then closing prayer and salutation. So let's look, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Please notice, uh, as is the case in so many New Testament epistles, uh, this greeting of grace. So we have three of these co-workers together. They were the three that had planted the church. Now addressing again the Thessalonians, Paul, Silvanus, or Silas, and Timothy. But it's this greeting of grace and peace. Seventeen epistles begin with the greeting of, greeting of grace and peace. And I've repeated this every time we've started an epistle almost, but it's uh, grace is that you know Greek greeting common in the day. Peace is a, a Jewish greeting common in the day and still today. But the significance, I think, is that to a Christian, uh, grace and peace have much more significance than they would to somebody just greeting you on the street. And, and the depth of word, you know, the, the <laughs> New Testament's written in Koine Greek, the common language of the street. And yet, so many times, the New Testament takes street words and makes them so deep and beautiful and meaningful uh, because of their connection to Jesus Christ. So that's what you say, see with words like grace and peace. Um, you have thanksgiving for the endurance of the Thessalonians. This is what I mentioned a minute ago. But look at these verses, verse 3 and 4. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of, of every one of you all abounds toward each other so that we ourselves boast of you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecution and tribulation which you endure. So Paul is continually giving thanks because of their growth in faith and love. Uh, we noticed twice in 1 Thessalonians he, he puts the big three in one verse, faith, hope, and love. And here he puts faith and love together uh, in, in a commendation of you know, their, their ability to understand the important things in, in, when it comes to being Christians and, and to live those out. One of the things we noticed in 1 Thessalonians, Paul hadn't got to spend much time with the Thessalonians. And the, the, he hadn't been able to, to ground them deep in you know the intricacies of uh, the doctrines of Christ, if you are the doctrine of Christ. But they got the big rocks. Talking about big rocks, you know that we're trying to get in these in our classes for the kids. They definitely got the big rocks of Christianity. They got the faith, hope, and love. And he's commending them for holding on to that, even when times are tough. And they continue to be tough for them. So he's very thankful to God for them. He's so thankful, in fact, and he says the same in 1 Thessalonians, that he's using them as a, a praiseworthy example to other churches. Um, all through you know, Macedonia and Achaia, he was holding them up as, look what the Thessalonians are doing. Here's this newly planted church, and they're hanging in there in faith and in love, despite going through such harsh afflictions and persecutions. So they're praiseworthy examples of this, this endurance he says that he boasts among the churches of God 
for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. What can we share with our classes on these first few verses? What would you focus on with young people? Anything? Got a lesson plan for any of that? Hmm? Well, they made it through persecutions and tribulations because of their uh, patience and faith. So I think that's something we can learn today. Right? And we're, it may not be the same persecutions or tribulations that they're facing, but it may be one day. Right. Right? We've got to prepare ourselves for that. But whatever tribulations and that we're going through, and children all the way up and down from some of the very youngest all, certainly all the way through up to high school uh, are not harshly persecuted but they're sometimes ostracized made fun of bullied for trying to do the right thing and I, I think there's something we can teach our children here about you're trying to do the right thing uh, sometimes people aren't going to like that they're going to treat you unkindly because of that and uh, what it means to, in steadfastness, hold your ground and do right for the Lord's sake, even when you're going through that. They need to understand that it's not unique in their lives, that anybody who's trying to do good is going to experience that. Uh, and, and I think just that fact will be helpful even to little kids, uh, perhaps. So I, I think that's a great point, Gary. Uh, let go. Yeah. Instilling in them, the, uh, helping instill in them the self confidence <coughs> to do that. Right. right. Because shrinking back, thinking that, maybe not at a young age, but thinking that meekness means shrinking, you know, is, is, is not, you know, um, but. It's, 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 a, it's a difficult thing, you know, for, for some. Well, yeah, it is. It, it, right. <laughs> for a lot of us. All right. All right, let's pick it up in, in verse 5. He, he's been talking about their persecution then, and then he says about it, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you also suffer, since it's a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So he's talking here about punishment of their persecutors, but he's talking about it in the context of the righteous judgment of God and relying on God's judgment. Here's something that can see us through the most unfair of times in our lives, to know that the Lord is going to you know, level out every mountain and valley and it's all going to be made straight. Every, every injustice is going to be taken care of by Him. He's going to take vengeance on everybody who needs vengeance taken on them. And we don't have to worry about all that and we can give it to, to Him because He's just. And, and really, that's, that's what Paul's saying. The persecution of, of these faithful Thessalonians is a clear indication that God's judgment is coming on the persecutors and also then indicative of his fairness. So the Thessalonians, the, the thing about this is they're suffering, but their suffering demonstrates their worthiness uh, to be part of the kingdom of God. Um, so many passages in Scripture, Jesus talked about it in Matthew chapter 5, didn't he? Uh, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they, you when they revile you, say all manner of evil against you falsely. For my name's sake, he says, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Uh, there, there is... Um, there is a benefit, there are several of them, but there is certainly a benefit to suffering for righteousness' sake. And the Thessalonians needed to make, Paul needed to make sure the Thessalonians were fully aware of that. In, um, in Philippians 1, Paul wrote to the Philippians along the same line, 
Uh, and he talks about how they shouldn't be in any way terrified by their adversaries, which to them is proof of perdition. In other words, their destruction <laughs> is, or is going to be a result of trying to persecute Christians, but it's an evident token of your salvation, he says, and that from God, for to you it has been granted, think about this language, for you it has been granted that on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but to suffer for his name's sake. It's, that's, a, that's a gift. You get to suffer. <laughs> that doesn't sound like, but that's what he's saying, isn't it? You get to suffer for the name of Christ. And considering, as we did Sunday morning in the sermon, what Christ has done for us, that's a privilege. Uh, and to add on top of that, heaven itself, uh, I mean, that's just some really uh, positives, uh, big positives, when it comes to having to go through difficult times. So in 1 Peter 4, just quickly, I'll just mention this one other passage along this line. I'll read this. Peter says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you also may be glad with exceeding joy. If you are for Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he's blasphemed, but on your part he's glorified. So you have, in, in all three of these passages that we've just looked, you have a dichotomy of those that are the persecutors and those that are persecuted. And the persecutors think that they have the upper hand, but really uh, their, their persecution of others is their ultimate perdition and destruction. I mean, they're headed to the bad place because they're doing that, right? So over here, it looks like the, the ones who are being persecuted are getting the raw end of the stick, but really they're glorifying Christ. They have the anticipation of heaven to look forward to. They have the participation of uh, being with him in his sufferings and the fellowship with him now in this life. So all of that is positive. And so, you know, the Lord just turns a lot of things that seem to be a certain way in this world, he turns them on, on their head, doesn't he? And when we look at them from a heavenly perspective, then they're much different than maybe at first they seem to be. So the Thessalonians come to work the kingdom. Their persecutors, on the other hand, are going to be repaid uh, by God for the trouble that they have caused. Romans chapter 1, Paul speaks about uh, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. In Romans chapter 12, uh, do not avenge yourselves. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Uh, in those passages, also in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 6, the Lord is the avenger of all such. So God will trouble the troublers. He will uh, punish the persecutors. And when Christ returns with the angels, then the Thessalonians will have rest. Again, you have this contrast between the two groups, between the persecutors and the persecuted. The Thessalonians who are being persecuted, when Christ returns, they're going to have rest, while those who do not obey the gospel will be punished, it says, with everlasting destruction. Anything but rest. Right? Anything but rest. This comports really well with um, Jesus' teaching in Matthew 25, when the, the king comes with his holy angels, sits on the throne of his glory, judges between the sheep and the goats, you know, all of that, Matthew 25, uh, verses 41 through 46. And it, it goes along really well with uh, what's described in Revelation chapter, chapter 14, where where those who worship the beast align themselves with evil in this world and persecute God's people are going to be tormented uh, with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, it says. That's Revelation 14 and verse 10. Again, such a similarity between that and what we have in First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians here. The holy angels of Christ coming in flaming fire with Him rendering vengeance on the persecutors of God's people. All of that is on display in Re Revelation 14 as well. The smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. Everlasting destruction. Uh, so, you know, you think about Paul's description of how you 
take difficulties in this life, as he writes to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians, the, the things that keep us going, you know, are, are the eternal things. We, we don't look to the temporary, we look to the eternal, right? As he writes to the Roman, uh, the, the persecutions that we suffer are working for us an eternal weight of glory, okay? So those are the, the, the same concepts that he's sharing with the, second, with the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians. What does, that, what does that tell us um, then about, again, how do we deal mentally and emotionally with being persecuted in this world? What's, what's, what's the bottom line lesson? What's the big rock you want to get out of that? What are we going to tell our kids about it? Yeah. Right. And again, it's looking at it from an eternal perspective, from a heavenly perspective. And if we can get, we ourselves, if we can look at it that way and then get our children to conceive of it that way, um, you, can, you can go through anything. Uh, you, you can endure anything if that's your perspective. If that's not your perspective, you can't endure anything. It's just the, you know, it's just the opposite. But when you understand that, uh, faith and faithfulness and endurance are all possible. Um, if you look at the last little section of this chapter, uh, again, Paul talks about the coming of Christ when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Therefore, we also pray always for you that God would count you worthy of this calling, fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So th there's a focus there on the glorification of Christ, uh, both in the world to come and in this life, as these Thessalonians are enduring these persecutions for his name's sake. They're sticking with his word and his ways for his name's sake to glorify him. So uh, it seems to me that the main focus there is on Christ's glorification, but also then that... Uh, the Thessalonians, who are faithful, are also going to be glorified and participate in the glory of Christ. So glorification of Christ by the saints, he's going to be marveled at by all those who believe. And then Paul prays that the Thessalonians, in this passage, he prays that the Thessalonians would live lives, um, would live lives to Christ's glory, that they also might be glorified in the end with him. Uh, I love the picture in, in Revelation 3. To him who overcomes, I will grant sit with me on my throne. Glorified with Christ. Uh, elevated with him. He elevates us with him. And uh, that's, that's what we're looking forward to. We glorify him. Uh, he'll be glorified eternally and will be glorified with him. All right, we need to get into chapter 2. I've dilly-dallied a little bit. Sorry about that. Sometimes I get wordy. Um, but we need to look at chapter 2, the first half of it anyway. And like I said, this is kind of the meat, uh, the core of Paul's message. He says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, which he's written about, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Thessalonians Five. Now, this big, this big clarification. Uh, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. So there, there were some who apparently had decided that what Paul had described in 1 Thessalonians 4 had already happened and somehow they missed it. Uh, I, I don't know. Or it was soon to come, uh, almost immediately, and so they should just wait around for it. That seems to be implied in, in the next chapter. That, that was how, how, how some of them are dealing with it. Kind of interesting, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians is one of the first epistles Paul wrote, besides 1 Thessalonians, may be the, about the second one that he wrote. 
Second Timothy is certainly the last one that he wrote 15, over 15 years later. It's interesting in Second Timothy chapter 2 uh, that Paul will talk about, uh, tell Timothy about that he needs to shun profane and idle babblings. And he says, um, they spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, strayed from the faith, saying the resurrection has already passed. So there were specific people who were spreading this doctrine, and I don't know, but what the, they may well have been uh, this, these kind of folks in Thessalonica, and that's what Paul is concerned about. And maybe even writing fake epistles, it seems to me, or saying that Paul told us to tell you this, something like that. Or, you know, Paul says, don't be shaken uh, by word or epistle as if from us, as if that's the case. The resurrection uh, has not already passed. The, the day of the Lord has not already come. Um, and he explains then that the falling away must come first and the man of sin might be revealed. This man of sin or man of lawlessness, uh, I like uh, what was written in the reader's material on this point. And I'll just summarize it quickly. This is a difficult passage to understand. I, I think no matter who you are. Um, so there were three points that were made uh, about studying this section. Anytime we study something that's difficult, we need to study in light of what's known from Scripture. And whatever conclusion we arrive at, we know is not going to contradict things that we know from Scripture. So that's one thing. Secondly, we may not understand everything, but we can still understand the main point being made. And I think you can understand the main point of this section without a whole lot of trouble. We don't know the details maybe so well, but we can definitely get the main point of it. And the third thing, uh, don't let the difficult text make you question your faith. You sh we should expect, we're reading the words of God. We should expect, this is God's mind to us. We should expect some, some of this stuff's gonna be over our heads, right? <laughs> it's, his, it's his mind. He's trying to explain things to mere humans. And uh, some of it is just gonna be, we can, we're not gonna get all of it. That's all. There. We can understand his will and understand his word. That doesn't mean we, we, we're going to, you know, think like he thinks. So we need to uh, get a grip on that, so to speak. I want to spend then some time uh, that we have, the time we have remaining, looking carefully at this man of sin and his coming, which must precede the second coming of Christ. And then we'll talk a little bit about some possibilities of interpretation here. Um, in picking up in verse 3, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. The man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they might believe the lie, that they all may be damned who did not believe but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So here are some facts we can take away from what those scriptures teach. Man of sin or the son of perdition who is to come and reveal himself before and be destroyed before the second coming of Christ. Okay, He is someone who exalt himself as God. All right, that, that sort of narrows this down, doesn't it? Uh, he'll exalt himself as God. Paul had previously warned the Thessalonians about this. So uh, Paul had information uh, prophetically from the Lord that this was going to be the case before the Lord came. And uh, he had shared some of that with them while he was with them. Of course, I'm sure in the few weeks that he was there, he was overloaded with information. And so, uh, you know, don't you remember that I told you that? 
Paul, you were here like four weeks and you told us 10,000 things. We can't remember all that. Uh, I'm sure that's what they're thinking. Uh, so, he, but he did no doubt tell them that. Um, he also says the man of sin is already at work, um, but was being restrained. So that kind of indicates we, we have both what the man of sin is going to do, elevate himself as God, that's part of what he does. And then the fact that he's already at work, which indicates it's not something that's going to start 2,000 years later, okay, for sure, because it was already starting then, uh, whatever it is, whoever it is that he's talking about. His, his coming is according to the working of Satan. So this person is going to be a puppet of Satan, doing Satan's will. And uh, he's going, they're, they're going to be deceived by signs and lying wonders. Uh, and those who do not love the truth will be deceived by those things and then be punished. So those are some things you get out of, get out of that text. Um, Paul didn't want the faith of the Thessalonians to be shaken by this false teaching regarding the second coming of Christ. And the thing is, if they had believed that the resurrection was just imminent, the second coming was imminent, or that it had already happened, that really shakes your faith. The word shaken there is a word that means like the, the waves that go back and forth, you know, just or shaking a a table with a bunch of rocks on it, and they all come tumbling down sort of thing, playing Jenga, you know, all that falls down. That's, that's the idea of, and, and Paul says, if, if you're going to have this wrong idea about the second coming and the resurrection, just knocks everything concerning. And so he's really concerned a, a, about it. Um, so what is this talking about? Who is this talking about? You think, Hindsight being 2020, we'd be able to get a, a bead on it. But it, it still remains, I think, difficult to interpret. It seems that um, there are some places to turn in Scripture where you could conceivably find some interpretation. Um, if you look at history uh, and the likely suspects, Talking about uh, Gnostic apostates have been suggested, um, Roman emperors have been suggested, uh, and the papacy has been suggested, the, the Pope, uh, among others, uh, solutions to this. And, and some take it in a more general sense. Uh, it seems to me that he has some per specific person or probably persons in a specific position in mind. Uh, when he's talking here. And um, all three of these, if you want to think of them as options, I don't like to use that terminology, but <laughs> if you want to think of them as options, they're really not. There's only one right thing here. Uh, so we don't want to miss that. Um, but possibilities, maybe that's the word. Um, all three of them have some connection to Scripture. You know, John in 1 John writes uh, against the Gnostic apostates uh, who were just coming into view uh, at the end of the first century and would dominate heretically as far as the biggest heresy in the church in the second and third centuries. It was Gnosticism, hands down. Uh, so we don't even know about it today, but you know, that was huge. And, and so 1 John, the word Antichrist uh, which you could think to be somebody who's against Christ, a man of sin and lawlessness, if you will, really uh, kind of parallel to the man of sin and lawlessness. So a lot of people, the word antichrist is only used by John in First and Second John. And he describes this, these people you know, who come out of Christianity, think they know it all, and uh, are trying to destroy the faith of Christians. Uh, but their, their approach is different. They say Christ, Christ never came to begin with in the flesh. Uh, they don't really try to destroy the concept of the resurrection. So some of the things that he's saying about the man of sin and uh, things related don't really fit the Gnostics. Okay, uh, They don't have a particular one leader either. Someone who's in a prime position who's receiving worship. Uh, so they didn't have that. So some of that doesn't fit. Um, and the papacy, obviously, the Pope, but that wouldn't happen for uh, several hundred years. 
usually 606 is the date for the first pope that at least Protestants give. Um, I, I don't know if that fits as well, you know, either, because it would be some centuries before that really uh, came into, into full, full-blown apostasy. Um, but there are lots of things about the papacy that remind you of this. You know, the pope receives worship, sets himself up as God, uh, several other things related to that. Uh, my, my leaning is toward the Roman emperors, uh, which are, if you look at, at Revelation, go over to Revelation with me, and I know y'all, many of you are familiar with this. So in chapter 13, you have the sea beast and the land beast, which plainly represent uh, the Roman Empire and false religion uh, connected to the Roman Empire. And if you just read what's the, the sea beast, which is the Roman Empire, um, verse 4, they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like the beast who is able to make war with him? He was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. He was given authority to continue for 42 months. He opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, those who dwell in the earth. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of, of, life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And then the, the beast out of the earth, or the land beast, if you look at that, uh, verse 12, he exercises all authority of the first beast in his presence, causes the earth and all those who dwell on the earth to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire to come out from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. He deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs. So just think about this. You have somebody who's empowered by Satan. Satan gives him his power. That's what it says in, in verses 4 and 5. This person is worshipped. People are forced to worship him. They're deceived into worship him. They're deceived by signs and lying wonders. Um, so it just looks like just almost everything about that is parallel to the man of sin in, in, first Thess in Second Thessalonians 2. Um, in fact, I, I'm hard-pressed to see where it's not parallel. And I have no doubt at all that Revelation 13 is you know, talking about the emperors of the Roman Empire going into the second century. So uh, that seems against, I don't want to be dogmatic, but it seems that that um, fits pretty well. And so what Paul's really saying is there's got to be this huge persecution of Christians, um, a, a falling away as a result of that, that's going to come by this man of sin, these Roman emperors, and then they're going to be taken out of the way. And then, after that, at some point, Christ will come again. And again, that lays out in Revelation as well. You have, uh, after the Roman emperors are taken out, you have this thousand-year period of, and then finally, Christ comes. So, that fits very well with all of that. All right, well, I'm past time, and so don't have time to cover my key concepts today. Sorry, went a little long. Um, pick up there in Second Thessalonians, middle of the chapter, Sunday morning. Thanks for your help tonight.